Okay, thanks very much, everyone. I think um, there are some, still some people joining, but um, we'll get cracking now. Um, so, good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Stuart Pemble, and along with my colleagues Caroline Hanratty, Emma Nash, and Alison Garrett, we are going to be presenting uh, this afternoon's seminar on modern methods of construction. You should all see our contact details uh, on the screen at the moment. Um, and the slides will be sent to you along with a video recording uh, of, of today's seminar at the end. Um, everyone should be muted. Um, uh, so if you do want to ask a question, and there will be an opportunity for questions, please do use the Q&A button on Zoom. Um, if we can't answer all the questions in the time available, then we will um, respond to everyone who's asked a question afterwards. This is what we're going to talk about. Um, uh, Caroline's going to start by talking about the pros and a few cons of modern methods of construction by way of an introduction. Um, Emma's then going to talk about how to procure a modular project and the key things to, and issues to think about. And Alison's then going to finish things off by discussing the, the legal issues about responsibility between the parties and how the construction, how the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act uh, affects things. So over to Caroline. Well, that was a great start. <laughs> I'm very sorry I hadn't unmuted myself. Schoolgirl error. I'll start again. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline Hanratty. I'm a real estate partner at Mills and Reeve. I specialise in development work, including hotel development. So, what do we mean when we say modern methods of construction? Well, it's a wide term embracing a range of off-site manufacturing and on-site techniques that provide alternatives to traditional construction. So everything from timber frames to whole wall panels supplied with windows, insulation and external cladding, to volumetric or modular construction where pods or modules from a bathroom to half a house are supplied ready-made. Modular construction isn't new, it first became popular after the Second World War, when there was a need for rapid construction of buildings to replace bomb damaged buildings and to accommodate the returning troops. But these buildings often remained in use well beyond their design life and were often less attractive than traditional buildings. Prefab became a bit of a dirty word, but it's definitely making a comeback. And like many other changes to business and behaviors this year, the change in attitude to MMC has been accelerated by the pandemic. It's seen as one of the solutions to the current housing shortage in the UK. Housing Secretary Robert Jenrick recently announced that at least 20% of homes funded by a new £12 billion affordable homes programme will need to be manufactured using modern methods. But we're also seeing it frequently used in hotel developments and student accommodation. And the scope for MMC doesn't stop there. In 2017, a host of government departments promised to use off-site construction ahead of traditional construction for their capital programmes. So what are the benefits of modern methods of construction? Well, the product to start with. About eight years ago, I was sat in the boardroom at the offices of Manchester developer Urban Splash, and the FD was very excited about a piece of wall that was sat in the corner of the room. What other product would you buy, he asked me, that had been built in a muddy field and exposed to the elements during production? This was the start of their house project, project launched in 2016 and offering buyers a completely customizable home made in a factory. Factory assembly of what can be complex elements, particularly where there are services involved, means that consistently high levels high standards can be achieved. 
snagging and defects are reduced. When you have a factory assembling large units one after another, it's much easier to ensure that there is a much better consistency between each unit. So factory built means quality control, achieved through repetition, inspection, and operating in a controlled environment. And of course, build quality is increasingly important in achieving high environmental standards. Buildings often fail to achieve their design performance because of poor quality control on site. Then there's the speed of delivery. I've worked on a couple of hotel developments now where the bedroom pods were constructed in China and assembled on site. The 220 bed Holiday Inn Express at Event City in Manchester was constructed from purpose-built steel shipping containers, complete with factory finished interior fixtures and fittings, all of which were installed before being delivered to site. Each module consisted of two bedrooms and a section of corridor, with all 220 bedrooms placed on site in less than three weeks. So modular means shorter building programs. The production of the modules can happen simultaneously with site work, allowing some projects to be completed in half the time of traditional construction. The project is less impacted by weather, by local labour shortages or by vandalism. Factories can operate 24 seven instead of the restricted hours of a construction site. Fewer people are needed on site at the same time, so homes can be delivered faster with the same on-site labour. The benefits of modular were demonstrated dramatically earlier this year, by the delivery of 2,400 beds in two brand new field hospitals in Wuhan, China, in just 12 days. Next slide, please. What about the cost? Well, cost savings can be made through supply chain management, economies of scale, reduction of waste, and working in a controlled environment. There is also a reduced need for on-site storage, plant, and other equipment. So there's no need to pay an adjoining owner to let you use, uh, put your site compound on their land. The impact of the, on the environment is a big selling point for MMC. Factory built means waste is reduced by recycling materials, controlling inventory, and protecting building materials. Fewer products are wasted and damaged because they haven't been left on the floor of a building site, which isn't weather tight. And the likelihood of damaging materials is much lower when they only have to be delivered to a factory through a doorway and not handled several times and moved up several floors. Factory building also reduces the need for heavy machinery on construction sites. Some estimates say that the switch to off-site construction, as well as increased efficiencies in power usage and heating, could reduce the carbon footprint of a project by as much as 40%. Modular buildings can be repurposed, with modules being relocated or refurbished, reducing the demand for raw materials and the amount of energy used to create a building. Now that those field hospitals in Wuhan are no longer required, we hope, perhaps they can be relocated to where there is a current need. Next slide, please. And what about the impact on society? Well, removing most of the construction activity from the site significantly reduces the period of site disruption, reduces traffic and improves safety and security. And this has a huge benefit for both education and healthcare projects, of course. The indoor construction environment reduces the risks of accidents with everyone working on a single story and not at height. There's the potential for reskilling an aging construction workforce for the new jobs in module production. And those jobs are more appealing to a wider section of society. They're family friendly jobs in a warm factory, not on a freezing cold site where people can work nearer to home and their place of work doesn't move around and the hours of working are much more flexible. And it can be a force for good. So James Waits recently suggested that we could prioritize placing off-site facilities or temporary pop-up fabrication units near areas of social deprivation to provide job opportunities where communities need them most. But there are some disadvantages and limitations MMC still suffers from perception problems resulting from historic performance. This can result 
in lower valuations and cautious lenders. Mass offsite construction only really makes sense for large numbers of repetitive units where the size of each unit is easily transportable. And shifting production offsite introduces a new risk. Having one or two suppliers, rather than a series of smaller contractors assembling the entire building on site, can create more supply chain vul vulnerability. You're wedded to your modular supplier at a very early stage, meaning that if something goes wrong with that relationship, there's not much you can do. Much more design has to be done up front due to the lead in time for the modules. They, need to start, they may need to start being made before the building contract is even signed, which of course carries a risk. While traditional building methods allow for late changes in design to be made, mod modular construction is less likely to be able to factor that in. And what about when the pods arrive and there's a problem with, say, the bathroom tiles? Well, then there's a problem with every single unit and you can't exactly take them back to China. Some payment terms mean that you have to pay most of the cost of the modules as they leave the factory, wherever in the world that may be. So commercially, that's not ideal for a developer. And from a practical point of view, module sizes and shapes can be limiting and there can be issues with transporting and handling the modules and with de delivery if it's a site with limited access. Now over to Emma to talk about the building contract. Thanks, Caroline. So to introduce myself, I'm Emma Nash and I'm in the construction team at Mills and Reeve. I specialise in negotiating and putting in place transactional construction contracts. So Caroline has just given an excellent description as to how modern methods of construction are changing the face of the construction industry in a positive way. However, once you've chosen to benefit from modular manufacturing in your project, where do you go from there? What form of procurement should you be using and what do you need to think about in order for your project to be a success? Question number one, how should you procure a modular construction project? The first thing you need to think about is your project's objectives, because that will help you decide which option suits you best. The first option is for the employer to appoint a main contractor on a design and build basis with a single point of design responsibility. This is typically under either the NEC4 ECC or the JCT design and build 2016 forms of contracts and we would often put in some suitable amendments to these. Under this approach, the main contractor takes full responsibility for the design, manufacture and installation of the modular units. It is up to the main contractor to appoint the off-site manufacturer, as well as the other relevant subcontractors, such as the subcontractor responsible for preparing the site. The benefits of this approach for an employer are that first of all, and ideally, the main contractor takes responsibility for coordinating the different components that are manufactured off site and their assembly on site. It is therefore cleaner for an employer to deal with just the one party who is then responsible for coordinating all of the subcontractors and suppliers. It's also easier for an employer to understand where their liability sits in terms of liability for delay and or design defects. Employers will, however, need to make sure that they have appropriate protections in their, in their contract and flow that down to any relevant subcontracts. And Alison is going to cover the traps that this procurement method may involve in more detail later on. An alternative method of procurement would be for the employer to contract directly with the modular manufacturers and also the contractor responsible for site management, as well as any other relevant subcontractors. Many employers do not have the expertise in-house to manage these different parties, so they may appoint a construction manager to do this for them, although not all employers do. This is commonly referred to as the construction management method of procurement. The benefits of this approach for an employer are that first of all, if an employer has a preferred off-site manufacturer, it has the freedom to appoint them directly. If a main contractor was responsible for this, an employer may be restricted to a contractor's preferred off-site manufacturer. It also means that the employer has greater involvement in the selection of its different contractors and their design. But it does mean, however, 
that the employer will need to take responsibility for coordinating its different suppliers and contractors. And not all employers will have this expertise, nor would they like to take on this level of risk. Alison is also going to cover in more detail later on the traps an employer may have to tackle when coordinating contractors in this way. So, once a preferred procurement method has been selected, this brings us to the key issues that you need to think about in order to get the best out of an off-site manufacturing project. The JCT 2016 and NEC4 standard forms contain many fine provisions, but regardless of the method of procurement, it seems to us that there are several provisions which should be considered at the outset and specifically referred to in your contract in order to protect everyone. The key items I'm going to cover now are title, insurances and delay, quality management and fitness for purpose. These provisions apply to a main contract between the employer and its contractor where there's a single point of design responsibility. If this route is used, a contractor should also seek to make sure that these provisions are covered off in its subcontract with any off-site manufacturer. The points I'm about to discuss will also apply if the employer contracts directly with the off-site manufacturer using the construction management route. So, moving on to title. Whichever form of contract is used, it needs to be very clear that ownership of any off-site goods transfers on payment. The employer and contractor, where it is the contractor who's appointing the off-site manufacturer, also needs the right to enter the premises where they are being stored in to collect the goods in the event that there is termination of the building contract. Next slide. For both the NEC4 and JCT 2016 contracts, we would recommend using a pre-agreed form of vesting certificate. A vesting certificate is typically a letter that's used to confirm that ownership of goods, plant or materials will transfer from one party to another on payment. It is typically used when goods, plant or materials are paid for by an employer which are off-site for whatever reason. This is often typically the case in modular contracting because in many instances an employer will have paid the majority of its fee for units manufactured off-site before they even get to site. So a vesting certificate helps to protect the employer if an insolvency happens to the modular contractor. In our view there doesn't seem to be an industry standard vesting certificate but there are some general provisions we would expect to see in any vesting certificate regardless of the method of procurement. And when a main contractor is subcontracting to a modular contractor, it may also be necessary to have a tripartite vesting certificate between the employer, the main contractor and the modular contractor. So first of all, the vesting certificate needs to clearly identify the assets it covers and that they are set aside, clearly identified and stored to the employer's satisfaction. It is key here that the employer has a right to inspect the assets. It also needs to clearly identify where the assets are being held. It needs to state that the manufacturer will ensure the goods until they are safely delivered to the site. It must contain an obligation on the contractor to deliver the assets to site, or if they fail to do so, the employer must have a right to enter the premises to collect the assets. Now this doesn't necessarily need to be in a schedule of amendments. The form of this can be in the technical, the technical documents instead if you're not going to be amending the front end. And on a practical level, it's really important to act quickly if you think there has been an insolvency event to ensure that the assets you've paid for are not disposed of or dealt with in any other way. And finally, an employer may also want to think about an advanced payment bond and or a bond in respect of payment for off-site materials and or goods. But there'll obviously be a, an additional cost attached to these. Next slide. So moving on to insurances and delay. In our view, many of the construction industry standard forms of contract were not written with off-site construction in mind. Some items which we think require a little bit of further thought and sometimes amendments to the standard form and in relation to insurances. First of all, it's a good idea to think about responsibilities for insuring any off-site manufacturing items, because it may not be clear in your contract if the, works insurances, if the works insurance policies cover these. 
Many of the standard forms do not explicitly contain insurance provisions for items manufactured off site. And while this may be covered in a vesting certificate, it may also be helpful to specifically cover this in your contract too. We think it's also, also worthwhile thinking about responsibilities for insuring and transporting any off-site manufactured items while they are being transported to site, because again, many of the standard forms of contract may not explicitly deal with these. And finally, it's worthwhile thinking about responsibilities for any delay that occurs off-site. For instance, regarding the factory where any off-site units are being manufactured. It may be arguable that a contractor should be entitled to an extension of time under the JCT Design and Build 2016 standard form, where a fire or other specified peril occurs at an off-site factory. However, given that the manufacturer should ideally have responsibility for ensuring and keeping safe its own factory, there is a strong argument to say that this should instead be a manufacturer responsibility. But given that this it doesn't seem to be expressly dealt with in the standard forms, it's worthwhile having a conversation about the risk profile for delay events during any tender process. And our view in general would be to think about responsibility for these items at the outset and ensure that they are documented in your contract to reflect the agreed position. Next slide. Moving on to quality management. As Caroline mentioned earlier, one of the key selling points of a modular project is that employers can benefit from enhanced quality control procedures. An employer should be thinking about how it can ensure that any off-site manufactured items are to the standards set out in its contract, because if the units are not on site, it may be really tricky to keep track of this. In our view, the key thing to think about here is that employers should ensure that in their contract, they are able to inspect the assets and that's particularly before any big payments are made. Next slide. Finally, that brings me on to fitness for purpose. As Alison will discuss later, there's often a fine line here between a contract for the sale of goods and a construction contract when it comes to offsite manufacturing. Traditionally, as I'm sure many of you know, a building contractor would always seek to exclude any fitness for purpose obligation in its building contract. However, with modular construction on the rise, it is arguable and also fairly controversial to say that a contractor should indeed be under a fitness for purpose obligation in relation to the design, production, manufacture and installation of any off-site units with the employer having a right to reject if the assets are not the standards set out in the contract. As Caroline mentioned earlier, it may be more difficult logistically to remedy any defects in a modular unit that arise once they're on site. So in light of this, there is an argument to say that the contractor should indeed be under a fitness for purpose obligation in relation to any off-site manufactured works. Another aspect in which goods contracts may start to affect construction is in relation to defects. Because a sale of goods contract would typically contain provisions which say that the goods must be delivered defect free. So arguably here, there is an argument to say that there should be no defects in any off-site manufactured goods when they are delivered and installed on site. So as I'm sure many of you know, a fitness for purpose obligation means that when complete, the project will be fit for its intended use. Arguably, if a school purchases a unit that is manufactured off-site in which they intend to teach, then the end result should be a classroom that is suitable for teaching in. Similarly, if the NHS purchases modular units that are to be used in a modular hospital, the end product should be a hospital that is fit for seeing to patients in. It's also worthwhile noting here that Section 14 of the Sale of Goods Act 1979 requires goods to be fit for their purpose. The NHS SBS framework for modular buildings does actually contain a warranty that the goods purchased under it will be fit for their intended purpose. It also contains a right to reject goods if they are found not to be in accordance with the contract. In addition, any delivery may be rejected if a reasonable sample of the goods taken indiscriminately from that delivery is found not to conform in all material respects to the requirements of the contract. From what I've seen so far, 
This hasn't yet found its way into the more traditional forms of construction contract, but it'll be interesting to see over the coming years if provisions that are commonly found in a contract for the sale of goods also find themselves in construction contracts. And it will also be interesting to see by implication the knock-on impact to construction insurances. That brings me to the end of my summary of key items to think about in your construction contract for off-site manufactured assets. Now over to Alison, we'll be talking about the Construction Act and interface risks. Thank you, Emma. Hello, I'm Alison Garrett. I'm a senior legal advisor in the construction team here at Mills and Reeve. And for the better part of 30 years, I've spent my time dealing with construction disputes. So what I'm looking at here today are issues that I have seen uh, in relation to a modular build uh, that have caused issues, if not disputes. And I've split this into two. Firstly, I'll deal with a responsibility between the parties and hone in on some of the issues there, some of which could be dealt with by amendments or drafting in your contracts. And then I'll look at the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and how that is intended to uh, apply so far as modular construction is concerned. Next slide, please. So firstly, I'm going to look at responsibility between the parties. And I'm going to look at that in relation to the two types of contract that Emma mentioned, the single point of responsibility, the design and build contract. And then I will also look at construction management. But firstly, in relation to the single point of responsibility, and just as a reminder, we're looking at a situation here where an employer enters into a contract with a main contractor to design and build. And the main contractor enters into the contract with the modular contractor. And I've set out on the slide the four issues that we have seen cause problems most frequently. And number one, without doubt, is coordination and interface. What do I mean by that? I mean the connections to be made between the work being take, undertaken by the main contractor or one of its other subcontractors and the modular contractor. This is probably best explained by reference to services. So for instance, you will have a main contractor bit, say, being responsible for connecting the services on site. And the modular contractor will have undertaken the works for the services within the units or pods. When those units or pods arrive on site, who is supposed to be responsible for actually connecting the two aspects of the services together? Often missed or often unclear. It's imperative in my view that it's made abundantly clear in the contract, who is taking responsibility. Make sure there is no gap. So that's the first point. Secondly, there can sometimes be an issue regarding solvency of the modular contractor. Uh, and this arises particularly between who takes responsibility between the main contractor and the employer. I'm not talking about the issue of what happens um, with regard to the goods if there's an insolvent situation of the modular contractor. Emma has dealt with that already. I'm more concerned, Emma's dealt with it in, and mentioned vesting certificates. I'm thinking about the situation regarding what actually happens on site in terms of getting a replacement contractor on board. That's hard enough in a normal situation where a subcontractor goes bust. But if you get a modular contractor who has half completed a design and possibly half completed units going bust, it's probably going to be more difficult to persuade an alternative subcontractor to build out and therefore take, it will take longer to resolve. There will inevitably be delay. Now, we've mentioned earlier that in fact the choice of a modular subcontractor in this design and build scenario is that of the main contractor. But the reality is that in relation to modular build, at least in relation to the very specialist areas, such as laboratories and maybe hospitals as well, there's a very po small pool still of modular contractors. And in fact, a, a main contractor may be uh, limited in its choice or may find that the employer has a view about who should be used. We're not talking about the age old nominated subcontractor where the employer imposes somebody on the, on the contractor, but, but they may 
have a view. Um, and in that situation, it may well be that the contractor feels that it shouldn't be taking on responsibility for an, a, a modular contractor who it feels is in financial difficulty. That is something for the employer and the contractor to work through in their contractual documentation before works commence. Other areas where we see issues, quality of the modular contractors works, same sort of point really, where a main contractor feels that they have had little choice about the modular contractor that they use, they may be uh, reluctant to accept responsibility if the design is found to be defective. One way around this um, is the uh, modular contractor giving to the employer a bespoke form of collateral warranty, not the straightforward normal form of collateral warranty, a more bespoke version. And finally, there's always the risk that with any subcontractor that the modular contractor might delay, might cause delay to the works. Now here, it seems to me there's not really re any reason why the position should be any different to any other form of contract where the main contractor is appointing subcontractors. The main contractor has entered into the contract on the basis that it will administer the works and its subcontractors. And while it may need to keep a more careful eye on the modular contractor, in principle, it seems fairly reasonable to me for it to accept that it's responsible for any delay that that modular contractor might cause. Next slide, please. The other form of contract that I said I'd just briefly touch on is the construction management form of contract, where just briefly the employer enters directly into contracts with each contractor, including the modular contractor. Again, we see issues with coordination in the interface. Arguably, it's more difficult here because in fact, the employer is trying to ensure that the modular contractors works, its services uh, coordinate with the other contractors that it employs. Again, very important that it's very clear not just in the modular contractors contract with the employer, but within all contracts that the employer has with contractors as to where responsibility and coordination lie. There must be no gap in the middle and there ought to be the exactly the same wording included in all contracts so that there can be no dispute that something different, something slightly different was meant in one contract rather than the other. Again, there's potentially an issue with the insolvency of the modular contractor, but the employer has taken on responsibility for that in, in a construction management contract or has usually taken on responsibility for that. More important from the employer's point of view, therefore, to check out the financial position of the modular contractor before it enters into a contract with them. And lastly, there are also issues about quality and delay. Um, in particular, delay uh, in this type of contractual arrangement, it's perfectly possible that each contractor will blame the, each other for any delay arising, including any delay possibly caused by the modular contractor. One solution here, and it, it, it's not a solution as such, as a way of mitigating problems, is for each contract to name an adjudicator rather than name a nominating body, to name a specific adjudicator, and that, that should be the same person in all contracts. The idea being that that adjudicator will then have a better feel and background for the project generally, and any decisions he, he or she makes are likely to be more logical in terms of the overall contract and each party's responsibility. That's what I have to say about responsibility. Now I'm just going to touch on the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and how it applies to modular. For those of you unfamiliar with it, it's often known as the Construction Act and it introduces the concepts of adjudication and payment provisions. It applies to all construction contracts. And if the particular contract does not have sufficient details about adjudication or payment provisions in it, then something called the scheme for construction contracts is implied into the contract. And 
at least so far as the payment provisions of the scheme are concerned, they are horribly complex. I have to put a wet towel over my head every time I look at them. You really don't want to be having to rely on them unless that was your specific intention from the start. Next slide, please. One aspect of the Construction Act that causes issues is what in fact is a construction contract? And this is where there is an issue in relation to modular construction. I've pulled out of the Act relevant clauses that, that, that apply. A construction contract is the carrying out of construction operations in England, Wales or Scotland. And it includes structures forming or to form part of the land, but it specifically excludes the manufacture or delivery to site of building or engineering components or equipment, materials, plant or machinery, unless also providing for installation. Next slide, please. Now, I'm not going to ask you to think in any detail about the three questions I'm about to raise because I appreciate it's half past four on a Thursday afternoon. But I'm just muting these points. What happens if you have a site that is in Dublin, but the modular con contractor who manufactures and installs is based in Edinburgh? Well, the answer as I see it is that the construction contract, the construction act is unlikely to apply. The installation and the site are outside of England, Wales and Scotland. What about if you have a site that is in London, but the modular contractor who manufactures and installs is based in Dublin? Well, I think the fact that the, the modular contractor is based in Dublin doesn't really alter the position. The site is in London, the installation will take place in London, London is in England and the Act is likely to apply. Third question, the site is in Belfast, but the modular contractor who manufactures only is based in Cardiff. Here, I think the act is unlikely to apply. And there are two reasons. One, Belfast is outside of England, Wales and Scotland. And secondly, the modular contractor is only manufacturing, they're not installing. That might leave you all scratching your head, which is sort of the point of this slide. Um, the point I'm seeking to make is with modular construction, it may or may not fall in or outside of the Construction Act. Protect yourself by ensuring that you have sufficient adjudication and payment provisions that you're satisfied with included in your contract and make sure they comply with the Construction Act so that you do not find yourself having to rely on the scheme. Next slide, please. And my last point relates to milestone payments. Partly, there are two points to this really. The first one is the practicalities of making sure your milestone payments are clear. And secondly, when the scheme could kick in if they're not. On your screen, you will see a list of milestone payments, which actually comes from a, a relatively recent case. Bennett versus CIMC. And if we have a look at milestone payment number two, which says 30% on sign off of prototype room by parking key homes Bennett in China. Well, what did that, does that mean? It's not exactly clear. And that was an issue that came to the, before the courts in the, in the case that I've just referred to. The contract had no definition of sign off, there were various references to sign-off in the contract. There were also references to verbal sign-off, which I struggle with. Sign-off to me means something in writing. Nor was it clear how you, you, the uh, subcontractor potentially got over the hurdle of parking key homes and Bennett, possibly not agreeing to sign-off something that was ready. Luckily for the subcontractor in this case, the court somewhat cleverly decided that they could determine what sign off meant. But the parties didn't need to end up in that position. They didn't need to be in court if the milestones had been clearly defined. So don't just whack in a payment schedule into any contract. Look at 
what is being said, look at the milestones very clearly and see how they're described. And my last point, which relates to the case again, which is that one of the arguments raised in the case was that it fell foul of the Construction Act. The Act says that every construction contract shall provide an adequate me mechanism for determining when payments fall due. Arguably, if those milestones were unclear, they didn't provide an adequate mechanism. Difficulties with that are that the scheme for construction contracts kicks in. And as I said to you at the beginning, try and avoid the scheme so far as payment provisions are concerned. It's horribly complex. Not only that, in the case of Bennett, there was a real risk that if the scheme applied, that in relation to milestone two, then it might have been entitled to the value of the work undertaken, which could have been far more or far less than the 30% on sign off referred to. So all in all, be very careful and very clear when you're uh, entering into a contract as to how you see the Construction Act working. It is always best to have specific terms to cover the eventuality that it does actually apply to your contract. That's all from me. I'll hand you back to Stuart, who will now take questions. Thank you. Thanks very much to Alison, to Emma and to Caroline. So if anyone would like to ask a question in the question and answer box on the Zoom, please do. Um, please type away and I say we'll try to deal with as many of them as possible. Um, for, whilst people are thinking about that, Caroline, I've got a question for you, which sort of relates back to the point you made at the start. Uh, that that this is the second coming of prefab, for want of a better way of putting it. And you also mentioned that prefab um, fell out of popularity. I suppose my question is, do you think it's likely that in 50 years time, the modern method of construction revolution will have come and gone and will also suffer from uh, sort of negative feedback? Um, I don't. Um, and the reason I don't is that I think that the approach to the uh, modular or the panels or the other other methods of modern, um, modern methods of construction, um, there has been a huge amount of time and money invested in uh, uh, the design uh, and build quality of the products. Um, which is very different from last time around. Um, it's not just about throwing up a load of uh, temp potentially temporary houses, but it's also about, there are other drivers, it's about choice, it's about design, uh, it's about quality, um, and it's also importantly about the impact on the environment and sustainability. So I think those drivers and the investment that is being made by um, the producers will mean that that's not the case. Thank you. Um, we've had a, a question that's come in. Um, um, does, uh, Alison, perhaps one for you, um, does special consideration need to be given to the INCO terms when producing a modular solution? Um, perhaps that's something that unless an obvious answer spins <laughs> springs to mind we, we might want to give some thought to and get back to on on, on that but yes i think i would like to give that some thought but to whoever actually raised that question i will respond to you when i've given it a little bit more thought um it, it, it's quite a technical question and i i need to give it more than a, a minute's thought before i answer it i think okay well having got you on the floor don't mute yourself i've got another question for you Obviously, a lot of your legal experience is, is coming from the point of view of trying to sort things out when things have gone wrong. Is it yeah. fair to say that the point you described as interface is yeah. really the big risk, however, however the project is procured? That, 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 that's, that's the challenge that everyone involved in modular faces going forward, just making sure that everything works. Um, yes, it is. Well, from my perspective, in terms of the issues that I've seen, uh, that is the, the key, the key issue, um, the key dispute area. 
Um, and in terms of drafting it within a contract, it's actually a technical point. Um, it's not something that lawyers specifically can draft for. They can include it within the contract, but they need advice from the technical team as to who is to be responsible um, and how it's, how it's to work. Lawyers can then review whether it makes, makes it clear so far as they're concerned, but they can't actually decide for the parties who is going to be responsible for what. Yeah, I, I, thank you. So one question that's come in for probably for both you and Emma to consider, which is the, the challenge that fitness for purpose obligations face when they come up against uh, uh, professional indemnity insurance uh, and design obligations. So how, how do we get round, if we can get round, the challenge that professional indemnity insurers, so far as design is concerned, feel that a fitness for purpose obligation is an absolute one, whereas they are only insuring up to the standard of reasonable skill and care. Do either of you have any thoughts on that? Sorry. Either Alison or Emma. Well, I think just initially, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not there's a shift in relation to that insurance point in because if more and more people start asking for fitness for purpose obligations within their contract then there's a question to ask as to whether or not insurance policies may also need to adapt for that as well because i think as i mentioned earlier there are some good reasons as to why fitness for purpose may be appropriate in certain contexts so i think we're not seeing that so much in contracts at the moment, but in a few years time, I think it'll be interesting to see whether or not that becomes commonplace in construction contracts. Alison, anything to add? No, I don't think so at this stage. I think that's, that's right. Okay. So we, we've had a question uh, come in on um, um, why, why we think that coordination and interface with a modular construction is different to a normal construction process. Um, over to you, Alison, on that, although I think I can yes. guess what the I, answer is. Yeah, I think, I think it's because um, the, the, the units or pods are constructed off-site, so the parties are not in uh, discussion in the same way as perhaps they would be if they were all on-site together. And it's because the modular contractor has a very clearly defined view of, of connection that they plan to make in relation to services. And the main contractor has a very clear view as to where they see their responsibilities starting and finishing on site. That doesn't happen um, with other subcontracts contractors in the same way, um, in that there's not that quite that build element. Uh, you, subcontractors might be doing all of the M&E work, for instance, on a, on a traditional site. A sort of follow up to that. Um, um, another question is asking effectively, is the answer to the tolerances and interface that that should be the role of the consultant acting as construction manager? Should be the role of the construction yeah, yeah, so, to, so, to so, define so, so, who's... Yeah, who yeah, one, either to define what, what those interfaces are, or two, to check that they all work. Yes, I, I, I don't um, have an issue. I think it probably should be the construction manager. I can't see why it shouldn't if, the, if there is one in place. But yes, it's key that, that is, um, somebody has that role. And it, it, it seems to me that the construction manager probably should be doing, undertaking that role. I think the difficulty happens when nobody takes on responsibility for it. Everyone okay. makes an assumption. Um, uh, th 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 this is the uh, a sli slightly left field question, which is we've um, had a question from someone who works for a modular company that acts as um, principal contractor and you know, main contractor under the JCT D&B contract with um, no problem delivering MMC projects. Presumably the issue there is that they have single point design responsibility under the DMB contract and effectively anyone they contract with, they are contracting with as a subcontractor. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because from what we've seen so far, um, 
it's just happened to be the case that lots of modular contractors just haven't had that level of expertise in order to deliver the full project in terms of doing the off-site manufacture and installing on site and making sure the service is in the site is ready to go so um that that's just been our, my experience certainly that the modular contractors haven't been able to offer that total solution but i think it's really interesting that people are being able to do that offer that service as well i think we should say that i have honed in on areas of uh, of, of problems because i have been a construction dispute lawyer for many years and that's what I see. But on the whole, I think modular construction probably results in less issues than mainstream construction. Um, thank you very much. There are some more questions, but I'm just conscious of time. So we, we will get back to everyone who has, um, um, who has um, uh, answered, uh, asked a question. Um, um, just before we finish, to let people know that there are um, a couple more webinars coming up in the new year, one on delay claims and disruption claims in January and one on uh, procurement in March, and we will send out invitations for people to uh, sign up to those. We'd also like to um, uh, post a uh, an advert for our construction blog, Practical Completion, and the webpage link is there. Um, finally, and keen to finish within the hour, um, when the seminar ends, there will be a, a pop-up inviting you uh, to give feedback, and we would please ask that you do so, um, and thank you very much for taking the time uh, to join us all this afternoon. Uh, we'd be interested in generally how you felt the seminar went, what future topics would interest you, and also whether the time uh, this stage sort of early evening or and the length of time taken is suitable for you. That having been said, it just leaves me to thank um, Caroline, Emma and Alison for their presentations and you all for being able to spend the time with us. So thank you very much everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>